We continue today in the book of Acts. Paul is on his second missionary journey. He's in the city of Athens. Where we pick up the today's story. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, Mars Hill, and asked him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects you worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, the one who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands nor is the one served by human hands as though in need of anything, since the one God gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor, the one God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth and allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for and find God though indeed the one is not far from each one of us. For this is the one in whom we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are God's offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals, while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent, because a day has been fixed when the world will be judged in righteousness by the person God has appointed, and of this God has given assurance to all by raising Jesus from the dead. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, Thanks be to God. The human mind is a perpetual factory of idols, wrote John Calvin. Drawing up on this quote, retired Methodist Bishop Will Williman wrote, The God whom Paul proclaims is not just another option for human devotion. Now reading that paragraph reminded me of an episode of the great television show King of the Hill. So, if we had the capacity to do so, this is one of those moments I'd play the clip. Unable to do that, let me read the scene for you after some setup. Hank, the no-nonsense Texas father, is bothered by his son Bobby's infatuation with the new youth minister, who's trying too hard to be super cool with skateboarding and Christian rock and such. Throughout the episode, Hank appears to be an old fart, who keeps trying to block Bobby's religious adventures. The episode ends with Hank taking Bobby into the garage and pulling a box down off of a high shelf. And that box includes a lot of Bobby's old things. Bobby, when I turn 18, I'm going to do whatever I want for the Lord. Tattoos, piercings, you name it. Hank, well, I'll take that chance. Come here, there's something I want you to see. Hey, takes a box down from the shelf and opens it up. Remember this, Bobby. 
My beanbag buddy? Oh man, I can't believe I collected those things. They're so lame. Hank, well, you didn't think so five years ago. And how about your virtual pet? You used to carry this thing everywhere. Then you got tired of it, forgot to feed it, and it died. Bobby, looking at a photo of himself in a Ninja Turtles costume. I look like such a dork. Hank, I know how you feel. I never thought that members-only jacket would go out of style, but it did. I know you think stuff you're doing now is cool, but in a few years, you're going to think it's lame. And I don't want the Lord to end up in this box. Willimon again. The God whom Paul proclaims is not just another option for human devotion. Last week, Randy Solberg emailed me a question that arose from his own personal daily Bible reading. He was studying Mark and had a question about the crucifixion story, and over a couple of emails, it led to this question. Does nationalism make it difficult to follow God? And I responded, nationalism definitely is an idol. If there's one abiding connection, and I think there's more than one, between Testaments, Hebrew, and Christian, is the issue of not putting an idol before God. Statues of Baal are not the concern. The concern is the desire for a god of thunder and war. Roman imperialism is the idol of Jesus and the apostles' time. Consumerism, narcissism, imperialism again. These are clearly the idols of our time. Now, in his sermon to the philosophers of Athens, Paul proclaims to them the God who made the world and everything in it, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, the God who is not simply one choice among many options, but the sovereign creator and redeemer who merits our worship and discipleship. Paul argues that this God is revealed in nature and can be grasped by the human intellect, and that the fullest revelation of God is in the story of Jesus and his resurrection, something at which the philosophers scoff. Now, this is a story, of course, that for those of us who are into philosophy, we really like. As an intellectual kid growing up, I relished this story. Paul engages the intellectuals on their own terms, quoting Greek philosophers and poets and proclaiming the gospel through the concepts and ideas that these thinkers would have understood. This story creates an ongoing expectation that the gospel be proclaimed in a way that inspires our best thinking. I believe that the God who created the universe and everything in it, the God who commands our worship and discipleship, the God who isn't a fad or an idol, is also the one who wants to open our minds and inspire us to think, to imagine, and to question. The choir's anthem today was taken from Psalm 25, which begins... To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let, me exalt my, do not let my enemies exalt over me. Make me to know your paths, O Lord. Teach me your truths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. So what is truth? In the passage that Margaret read earlier, the American philosopher William James declares that truth is what is helpful in life's practical struggles, what would help us to lead a better life. Horace Bushnell, the great 19th century congregationalist pastor and theologian, wrote that truth is that which finds us and thus enters into us. John Robinson, the pastor of the pilgrims, promised them as they departed for the new world that there was yet more truth and light to break forth from God's holy word. And Prince wrote, if you were given all the answers and you stopped to wonder why, how will you know the truth? 
So often we think of truth as certainty, something we can grasp, and once grasped, it becomes our possession. I believe truth understood this way is an idol. According to the psalmist, truth is a way, a path that we must follow. And many different voices remind us that truth is something which lives and grows. God is still speaking is something we proclaim in the United Church of Christ. In her book, The Evolution of a UCC Style, Randy Jones Walker, who's a professor of church history at the Pacific School of Religion, tried to identify what was the core feature of the United Church of Christ and our predecessor denominations and traditions. Here's what she wrote. Our UCC theological identity has never been found in a concise set of shared beliefs, nor in a common way of worship. It is certainly not found in our polity, which may surprise some of you. It is found precisely in our doubt. Our identity as the United Church of Christ lies in our doubt in the adequacy of any human containers for the Word of God. We doubt that the depths of God's revelation in Jesus have yet been fully explored. Our identity does not lie in set teaching or structure, but in a process. Our task today, as it was in our past traditions, is to think more clearly and openly about God, about Christ, about the church, so that we may cover our, recover our church's theological voice so that the gospel sings again from our minds, our hearts, and our actions. Wednesday, during our hymn selection conversation, I read that paragraph to Stephen Boma, and he said, well, that contains quite a lot. If Professor Walker is right, what we most share as a people is our entertainment of doubt the title of a 38-page chapter in her book, Tracing That History in Our Tradition. But we aren't skeptics who don't believe anything. Rather, we believe that Revelation hasn't ended, that there is still more for us to understand, that any theological formulation is provisional and open to revision. We are always listening to new voices and learning new things, rather than a doubt that ends the pursuit of truth, ours is a doubt that leads us to thinking more clearly and openly, using our minds as disciples of God. Professor Walker concludes that the willingness to entertain doubt should lead to a generosity of spirit and an ability to sit with and learn the language of people we find strange and perhaps even uncomfortable. Now we live in an age of questions, of seeking, of doubt. Fortunately, the God we proclaim, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, is no idol. The God we worship and follow is the one who made the heavens and earth and all that is within it, including our minds. God does not reside within a box, but leads us on the way of truth and salvation, always encouraging us to move deeper in our understanding, wider in our imagination, richer in our wisdom. So let us be a think people who think more clearly and openly, for that is a part of our obedience to God.